I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Dupixin or Dupilumab. It was approved by the Food and Drug Administration in March of 2017 to treat moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. That's childhood eczema that persists into adulthood because the medicine is only approved at the present time for those individuals over age 18 who are not controlled by appropriate alteration of their bathing habits, avoidance of irritants, and then use of topical steroids on the body and on the face or under the arms or in the groin, maybe use of a different medicine, medicine like Elodil or Protopic. The drug actually is the first in its class. It prevents a chemical known as IL-4, interleukin-4, from binding to the site on the cell where it begins its activity. And that seems to be very important. And the good news is that that same receptor, the IL-4 receptor, well, it also is where IL-13 docks, and those two chemicals, along with a variety of other substances, are involved in the immune process, involved in the allergy process, involved in the inflammatory process. So, blocking them seems to be very good. Now, the drug was sort of speeded through the process. The company requested priority review and breakthrough therapy status. Got through the FDA pretty quickly. Well, it's important because in atopic dermatitis, we can have significant problems that we don't have current medicines that really address safely. Atopic dermatitis affects as many as 1 in 10 children. The onset is by age 1 in 60%, by age 5 in 85%, and in a third of the people, it persists into adulthood. Now, it's been said, and, and it's a gross over-exaggeration, that a third of the people who have atopic dermatitis have moderate disease, and a fifth of the people, 20%, have very severe disease. What causes atopic dermatitis? Well, it seems to be in part hereditary or genetic. In part, it's due to an overactive immune system. And in part, it's due to the environment that teases the immune system that works in those genetically susceptible individuals. And when all things combine, then we get itchy skin, red scaly crusted bumps after the scratching, and then we get some swelling and cracking and weeping and oozing of the skin. The skin becomes thickened and fissured. Seems to occur especially in children around the face and adults more in front of the arms and behind the knees, but anywhere is possible, certainly. And these people are more prone to skin infections. The treatment, the standard treatment, is avoid excessive water, don't get too hot, stay away from things that irritate you, be careful of the dander from the animals, watch out for cockroaches, those sorts of things. And then, topically, you could apply some corticosteroids, topical cortisone, or maybe the elodil or the protopic to certain areas. For some people, ultraviolet light, other people need systemic steroids, either oral steroids, pill of cortisone, or an injection, maybe an injection of cortisone kenalog. And for some people, other more fancy medicines, azathioprine, methotrexate, cyclosporin, sort of used for a variety of other purposes. Atopic dermatitis is big business. Estimated tab associated with atopic dermatitis is in excess of $5 billion, and that was before these fancy new drugs became available. Well, people who have atopic dermatitis often have a variety of other kinds of allergies. They could have allergic rhinitis, allergic asthma, food allergies, and allergic itchy eyes, or conjunctivitis. They could have hives. And not only do they have the allergies, but they also seem uniquely susceptible to skin infections with strep and staph. And even when they get herpes, it seems to be oftentimes more severe and can spread in some individuals. And then for a variety of reasons, oftentimes atopic dermatitis is associated with anxiety or depression or maybe some conduct disturbances. And in a very small percentage of people, there seems to be perhaps a little increase in the incidence of lymphoma, type of a cancer of the blood cells. Well, the studies that were done on Dupixin lasted 16 weeks, two of them, and the third was 16 weeks with 52-week follow-up. They compared the drug with cortisone 
against the placebo injection with topical cortisone. So all the people were getting the topical cortisone. And the studies showed quite clearly in people whose average age was about 40, these people had the atopic dermatitis for about 30 years, there was about half of all of their skin was involved in the condition. Well, by the end of the 16 weeks, 40% of them, according to the investigators, looked like their skin was clear or almost clear. So 40% clear or almost clear versus 10% of those people who were just using the topical cortisone. But there's an interesting sidelight. How come there's 10% who are improved with using topical cortisone when they were supposed to be using the topical cortisone before they were in the study? Is it just because they were in the study? Same kind of cortisone, maybe even weaker cortisone. But they're perhaps somewhat more compliant. And by the way, the people who were involved in the study seem to have marked diminution in the itch. So we had a marked decrease in itch, marked improvement in the quality of life, less anxiety, less depression, and of course less itch, and the results were irrespective of the patient's weight or age or gender or race or even the type of prior therapy. So another study looked at long-term kind of outcome and what they did was they compared the injections with topical corticosteroids to topical corticosteroids when there was something to put the steroid on. When the patient cleared, the patient was allowed to stop using the cortisone, obviously because there was nothing to put it on. But there's a problem because the people were still being given the injections, whether they used the topical cortisone in that group didn't make any difference because they always were getting the shot. So they always had therapy versus the other group Sometimes they were going for periods of time without any kind of therapy. So the German Institute for Quality and Efficiency in Healthcare said, wait a minute, these people over here in the placebo group are being undertreated. They're not getting anything. And you're comparing no medicine to at least a shot every other week. And as a result of that, we can't tell how good or, or what kind of improvement we're getting from the medicine. So the study seems to be flawed. Now, the study was done with 740 patients, so that's a pretty good sized study. But anytime the drug companies are involved in these studies, we have to be a little careful, especially because they, in order to get the 740 patients, they used 161 hospitals and clinics and academic institutions in 14 different countries in Eastern Europe and Western Europe and the Asian Pacific area and in North America. The studies were done in Hungary and the Czech Republic and Poland and Romania and South Korea and Spain and Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the United Kingdom, Japan, Italy, the United States for a disorder that supposedly affects at least 3% of the total population. And they're saying that half of the people are moderately to severely affected and they have to use all those institutions to find the right number of people? Well be that as it may. The patients, again, when they received the medicine, they did extremely well, and 36% of them were clear or almost clear, according to the investigators, versus 13% of the people who were using the placebo and just putting on a little topical steroid. Well, we can look at what percentage of people had to go to a higher dose of topical cortisone. And it appears that the people who were receiving the injection of the dupixent, they hardly ever needed. About one in six persons needed some added boost of cortisone topically, as opposed to about half of the people who were just supposedly receiving the topical cortisone anyway. Now, the medicine itself comes in a syringe. It's already pre-mixed. To start the therapy, two injections are necessary. Same time, just different sites same amount of medicine, and then every other week a person gets just one shot, one shot of 300 milligrams. If you miss a dose, well, you can make it up at least as long as you remember to do that within a week of the supposed date when you're supposed to get the shot. If it's more than a week, 
later, then you just don't do it. You don't make it up. You just go back to your regular schedule. You give yourself the shot in your thigh and your abdomen, but not within two inches of your navel, your belly button. You rotate the sights. You can inject it actually in your upper arm too, or it's better if somebody else does it for you. You don't inject it in any site that's damaged or scarred or red or bruised. Fortunately, there's no latex rubber in either the syringe or the cap of the syringe, because a lot of people are allergic to the latex. Well, the medicine's stored in the refrigerator, specifically not in the freezer. You take the medicine out of the refrigerator about 45 minutes or more before you use it, before the injection, and you can actually, if you're going on vacation or for some reason you want to keep it out, you can keep it out of the refrigerator for up to 14 days or two weeks. The solution should be clear, maybe a little opalescent, colorless to maybe pale yellow. And if you're receiving the medicine and you don't get better by the end of 16 weeks, at four months, then the medicine's probably not for you. Are there side effects? Yeah, but they're not really significant or severe. Maybe a little irritation or some redness at the site of the injection, conjunctivitis, inflammation of the eyelid or eye itself, the conjunctiva in one person in six keratitis or inflammation of the cornea, maybe one, two, three, or four percent of the people, little inflammation of the eyelid, blepharitis, or itchy eye or dry eye, and small percentage of the people, rarely are there any significant allergic reactions to the medicine, although people do develop antibodies to it, so it's antibodies to the antibody of the shot, but they don't seem to affect the benefit of the medicine. There's questions, since we're intervening in the immune process, it doesn't seem to be a good idea to get a live virus vaccine, but it's okay to have the vaccines that don't have any live viruses, like the flu vaccine, that's okay. And the good news is that for people who have liver disease or kidney disease, it doesn't seem to make any difference whether you get the shot or not. The liver and the kidneys don't have anything to do with metabolism of the product. Now, as far as pregnancy is concerned, there's no good information. We know the medicine crosses the placenta. We don't know that it's really safe, but don't have any reason to believe it's not. But at the present time, it's not a good idea for pregnant women, nor is there information available to let us know that it's safe to use in breastfeeding women. At the present time, it is not approved for individuals less than age 18. However, the company has begun studies on children as young as six months of age. In older population, there's absolutely no problem. The medicine is a human monoclonal antibody. It's actually manufactured in Chinese hamster ovary cell cultures. It belongs to the class of antibodies that we call gamma globulin. It binds to this IL-4 receptor, and remember that means that neither IL-4 nor IL-13 can do their jobs, and their job is to cause inflammation. So we have a marked reduction in the inflammatory skin disease, this atopic dermatitis. It seems that the body metabolizes and degrades the chemical pretty much the same way it degrades our own antibodies. And again, liver, kidney, not dependent on that, so we don't have to worry about it like we do in some of the other kind of drugs. In this chronic itch disorder, and in atopic dermatitis, it seems that IL-4 plays a major role. IL-4 stimulates a protein known as Janus kinase, or JAK1, and that chemical stimulates itch. This condition, just the itchiness, that can involve up to 15% of the people, 15% of the population, causes unknown. It's not related to eczema or psoriasis or nerve disorders or diabetes kidney disease, liver disease, seems to be that the IL-4 is just getting out of hand. And it's that IL-4 that sort of links the immune system with the nervous system. Now, one of the problems with studies is that they're frequently done by drug companies. So, as is the case, Santa Fe and Regeneron, they funded the studies, they participated in, they conceived the studies, designed the studies, performed the analysis, 
performed some of the interpretation of the data, drafted the manuscript, revised the manuscripts. So we have to be a little bit careful. They tend to show when drug companies are involved in studies that drugs seem to be better than they are if there's an arm's length agreement and there are no people from the drug company involved. Well, the drug company thinks that this is going to be a big seller. They're estimating that by the year 2025, this drug is going to bring in in excess of three billion dollars, maybe in excess of four billion dollars a year. They're pushing hard. There are lots of ads, lots of direct-to-consumer ads, lots of ads to the medical profession, lots of media attention in the medical media to this particular drug. And why? Well, part of the reason is that they're expecting major competitors to be on the market within the next two or three years. One of them, nemolizumab is an IL-13 receptor inhibitor. So this one that we're talking about, the Dupixin, is an IL-4 receptor inhibitor or antagonist. The new one, the nemolizumab, that's going to be manufactured by another major dermatology company known as Galderma. Also have another one on the market right at the present time known as Zelgance that's principally used for rheumatoid arthritis, but if you have chronic itch, it's probably a relatively good drug. Unfortunately, that's quite expensive. There are other drugs that are going to involve IL-13 and IL-22 and IL-17. The numbers go on forever. But more interestingly, it was found that the same drug, the Dupixin, that we're talking about for this atopic dermatitis, it may well be very good for the treatment of asthma. And as a matter of fact, the drug company submitted to the FDA an application for licensing. They submitted it in March of 2018 and expect an answer by mid to late October of 2018. It's going to be for people who have uncontrolled asthma on conventional therapy of at least moderate to severe intensity for people who are over age 12, not over age 18 like with the skin rash, but over age 12 for asthma. And the medicine appears to be quite good for asthma. It appears to reduce the number of asthma attacks by about 50%. And if people have a lot of those allergy white blood cells, we call eosinophils, floating around in their bloodstream, if they have more than 150 in each milliliter of blood, and five milliliters equals a teaspoon. Well, if they have these eosinophils floating around, you could reduce the likelihood of asthma attacks by up to two thirds. And people who take the medicine are able to blow out more air. And the more eosinophils there are, the more air that gets out of the lungs. And that's what we want of our therapies. It's estimated that a million people may well be candidates for this particular drug. But again, in the study of almost 2,000 people, they needed 413 sites worldwide in order to get the data. So you wonder about quality control, you wonder about all sorts of other things when we can't with common diseases just do them in several institutions here in the United States. Well, as an add-on therapy, the Dupixin allowed people to reduce the dose of oral steroids that they were using, reduce the dose 70% of the people with Dupixin and 40% of the people with placebo, and half of the people who were receiving the Dupixin were able to completely get rid of this oral steroids. And oral steroids can have significant toxicity. They cause people to gain weight, get diabetes, develop osteoporosis sometimes develop glaucoma or anxiety or depression or heart disease, can cause immunosuppression. And interestingly, the company is working on the drug as a treatment for people who have nasal polyposis, polyps in the nose, and also for an allergic reaction in the esophagus known as eosinophilic esophagitis. And they're working on it with chronic idiopathic pruritus, that chronic itch condition that I mentioned a moment ago. 
And that condition is very common, like I say, 15% of the population. Low-grade inflammation, little bit of elevation of the eosinophils, little bit of elevation of the allergy-type antibody that makes people who have chronic idiopathic pruritus more closely related to those people with atopic dermatitis than they are to normal people if we look at the activation of the different kind of genes. Unfortunately, chronic idiopathic pruritus is not an inflammatory disease, so the topical steroids don't seem to work, nor do the oral antihistamines. But if we block the IL-4, seems to be very good and very helpful. Well, going back to the atopic dermatitis, it's estimated that about 300,000 people might be candidates for this drug. But unfortunately, the drug seems, at least in my experience, to be over-prescribed, prescribed to people who don't really have that severe an atopic dermatitis. The yearly cost, if you want to plunk down cash money, $37,000, about $37,000. Company figures that they get $30,000 out of it after the rebates and the discounts and everything else. They also have copay assistance. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is that this stupixent seems to be a very good drug and seems to have a role when used appropriately according to the recommendations of the Food and Drug Administration for those people who have moderate to severe disease, not mild to moderate disease, but moderate to severe disease, then the drug seems to be quite helpful. Now the problem is, how are we going to pay for the drug? If it's $37,000 a person, and we have 300,000 people with the skin rash that might be candidates, and we have another million people who might be candidates with the asthma, and then we have these several other conditions for which it's under study, where's all that money coming from? And where's all the money going? Well, those are questions that we just have to ponder. But at least as far as Dupixin is concerned, it does what it's supposed to do. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.